On today's episode of the Thrive More podcast, I interview Brooke Harris. Brooke is the founder and CEO of Good Milk Co. Good Milk Co. is an almond, hemp, and oat milk company, all natural. She's going to share uh, some insights on, you know, quote unquote, healthy foods in the grocery stores that aren't so healthy. So it's a really interesting conversation, and I learned a lot. But she's also going to talk about her journey as an entrepreneur. So it's kind of a two for one. You're going to learn about health and about some of the products that uh, we, we think are healthy that are not so healthy, in addition to her journey as an entrepreneur. And she just talks openly without a filter. And, and I love it. You're really going to enjoy this episode. Brooke is the founder and CEO of Good Milk Company. Better for you and better for the planet, plant-based milks. Brooke is also the co-founder of Rome, a lifestyle brand designed to find inspired and unique goods for your home. She has a great story, and I know at the end of this podcast, you're going to think about possibly the healthy thing that you're drinking right now may not be so healthy, because that's been my own uh, realization here lately. So Brooke, welcome to the Thrive More podcast. Thank you, Roger. Thanks so much for having me. Oh my gosh, yeah. Um, I had fun doing some research on you and your company and your products uh, before uh, we, we got to this podcast. And it was pretty enlightening. Um, I I pride myself on living a pretty healthy life and eating fairly clean. Um, but man, some of the stuff that I have now understand uh, has been you know, quite enlightening. So I can't wait for you to share this with the audience. But before we get into kind of the products and and really the basis for your company, can you talk about your journey of how, you know, what you were doing and how that started to transform? And then, you know, you, you out of that was born Good Milk Company. Yeah, I'm definitely an accidental entrepreneur. <laughs> Um, you know, in, in hindsight, it was, oh, it was always meant to be, but, um, I didn't go to business school. I didn't have the plan to start a business. I grew up in a really small town in, um, the middle of nowhere in New York state. My grandparents were dairy farmers. My mom was a teacher. You know, that was kind of the direction and, and path that most people were expected to take. I always knew that that wasn't for me. And I had I wanted to get out of that. I never I never felt like I fit in in, in that place. And it was an incredible place to grow up for many reasons. But mm -hmm. I always had a plan to run away at 16. <laughs> I, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that was my plan for a long time. Yeah. Um, but I fell into entrepreneurship just by trying to solve my own problem. And, you know, realizing there was a need for something that didn't exist and that I could maybe be the one to create it. Yeah. Yeah. Really much beyond that. Am I correct in saying that it's, um, it was really around some personal health issues and th that journey that, that brought you into entrepreneurship. Can, yeah. if, you, if you'd be open, you know, kind of talk about that. Absolutely. So yeah. I left Western New York and moved out to Los Angeles. I had, um, I had gone to film school and so wanted to work in film and television and once I got into that industry, it's it's pretty intense. Um, you know, long hours, weird hours, weird things you're doing, <laughs> always on the go. Yeah. And when I moved, I was a vegan. Hmm. And when you come from Western New York to Los Angeles, especially in, you know, whatever this was, 2008 or nine, um, you're coming from eating iceberg lettuce and hummus like is what you're living off of to a place like LA where there's just vegan everything there's vegan restaurants vegan grocery stores and now it's it's everywhere but you know mind you this was quite a few years ago um and I was in heaven and just eating all the vegan things the vegan burgers the vegan sausages the vegan cakes um and on the go constantly so eating anything that could be like grab and go eating in my car I had a you know, I joke with my friends like, oh, I know how I'm going to die. It's going to be from choking in my car while I'm eating. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm just constantly eating and moving. And um, and I, I got really sick mm. and it was really confusing. And because I thought I was I was eating healthy. So I spent a couple of years going to doctors trying to figure out what was going on. No one could figure it out. It was insane stomach pains that would have me like pulled over um, migraines, skin issues, I, um, you know, would eat and I could just feel the food like stacking up in my body. My body wasn't able to digest it. And 
all of these doctors, no one never, I've never asked about my diet beyond, you know, understanding that I was vegan, not questioning that nothing, there might have been a comment, well, maybe you should try some meat here or there, but, but nothing beyond that. At the end of it, got to this doctor who was like, I'm going to fix you, you know, did a, a endoscopy, a colonoscopy, did the, this camera pill that like took photos through as it traveled through my intestines, came back with a diagnosis of IBS, mm. which is a BS diagnosis, you know, sure, it, sure. Like, we don't really know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you're basically going to have to live with this. And it was just so frustrating and defeating and um, really, really hard to hear. And lucky for me, I was in Los Angeles. And in a very L.A. moment, I was hiking this this very popular hiking trail called the Runyon where people get like dolled up to hike because you see celebrities. And I was not one of those people. I was, you know, scrubby hiking with a girlfriend and we were talking about a cleanse she was about to go on mm -hmm. and uh, another very L.A. thing. Yeah. <laughs> And the woman, a woman who was hiking in front of us turned around, started talking to us about it. Turns out she was a holistic nutritionist. Mm. And I sat down with her a few days later. Within 45 minutes, she told me what was going on and said, hey, you need to cut out processed foods. And I was like, OK, well, that shouldn't be a big deal. Like, I eat healthy. Went home and started checking the labels of the things that I was eating and realizing, whoa, these are highly processed, a lot of ingredients that I have no idea what they are. And my almond milk was the one that was most surprising. Mm. It was something I was consuming multiple times a day. Yeah. Assumed be that it was healthy because it was was plant based milk. Me too. Me too. Yeah. Had never looked at, flipped it over to look at the package, and or the ingredients. And when I did, I was like, okay, this is not what I thought I was signing up for. There's also the nutrition facts don't make sense. There's no protein in here. I know almonds have a lot of protein. I now know that that's because. 2% of the container is almonds, which means yeah. about two, two to three almonds per <laughs> cup of you're getting, yeah. which is so crazy. The rest of it's just gums, binders, fillers. And the almond milk is what made me feel most discouraged because I was, you know, having it, cooking with it, putting it in smoothies, putting it over cereal. And so I Googled how to make homemade almond milk, um, you know, realizing there was nothing on the shelves that would be acceptable. And I don't know if you've ever experienced or tasted homemade almond milk. I have not, no. It's it's incredible. I mean, to at homemade anything, think about like your mom's pasta sauce or, you know, anything that's homemade versus what's in the store is going to yep. be way better. Yep. And plant-based milk is no different. And so started making it at home, fell in love with it, started feeling within two days of cutting out processed foods, I started feeling better. Wow. It was crazy. Um, and now, you know, my diet is very limited, if any, processed foods. And that was a work in progress. But based on how I felt and what a difference it was, I never turned back after that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and which has been a really exciting journey for me, but also a journey realizing how far removed we are from the most important thing we do every day, which is feed ourselves with fuel. Is, and it's fuel. the last thing we think about, right? It's like, what's quick? What's fast? How can I get this over with and go on to my, yeah. Yeah. And not even that, we have such a lack of understanding and we trust businesses to tell us what we should eat or what's good for us, you know, yeah. that are are built around making money. The food industry is no different than any other industry. Their their top priority is to maximize profit. Um, and they have and, very, very powerful lobbyists. Very powerful lobbyists. Yeah. Yes. yes. And the side of it where like, hey, what you're putting out actually impacts people, impacts their health, impacts their the way that they show up in the world, impacts them financially with medical bills. Like that's just not a factor in, in the industry. And that's a way that we do business differently is that's a huge piece of the perspective that we run everything to. Is this the healthiest? Is this going to be good for people? Is this going to make people feel good? Is this going to not do any harm to people? I will say, um, I'll just never forget this. I, I lived in Massachusetts at one point and we went apple picking and I'd never been apple picking and pulled an apple off a tree and bit into it and it was bright white inside and it tasted, and I'm like, this is what an apple tastes like? I've, I've never, I guess I've never tasted a real apple. Like, oh my, it's so different when it's, you know, that farm to table thing. So I, I've, I have experienced that in a different food and it, it, it was, you know, once I was blind, now I can see kind of thing. If we can just go back real quickly, I, just because it's always fun to hear. So you grew up on a dairy farm, yet you were vegan. 
right? So I would imagine no dairy. Um, and then you move, you go end zone to end zone, New York to, to LA um, and, and then film school. So I would just want, I'd, I'd love to understand like how you became vegan on a dairy farm and I grow up on a dairy farm. And because that's just, you know, there's a dichotomy there. And then I would just, I'm just curious, like uh, when you went to film school, like what, what were your goals? What, what did you want to do? Was it feature films? Was it, you know, commercials? What, 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 what did you, what were you searching for? Yeah. So I, I not only did I grow up on a dairy farm, but my family are all hunters. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. And my brother is a big time hunter. And um, so it's all about dairy and meat. Right. Yeah. And I became a vegetarian at age 12. Hmm. I didn't know what vegan was and I didn't become vegan until I was like 17 or 18. Um, but I became a vegetarian and milk just kind of always grossed me out. Um, I, you know, in our marketing at Good Milk, we don't speak really against dairy milk. I think people have a lot of information about dairy milk. Um, we are really anti the plant based milks that are pretending to be healthy because I think there is dairy that can be really good out there um, for for the people that it makes sense for. But I just never liked dairy, you know, never made, knew that it didn't make me feel good. But but at age 12, it was all about the animals. I loved yeah. animals. Oh, yeah. I wasn't going to eat meat. I didn't know anything about the nutrition side of it. But as I grew, as I grew up and started to learn more about the nutrition, that really became a motivating factor. Gotcha. Gotcha. OK, cool. And it's funny because my my daughter was was um, vegetarian for a while. And it, was, it was it was the animals. It was just all about when she finally realized that a chicken on the table is actually a chicken. It was game over. It was game over when she connected those dots at a very young age. Um, and, and then you go to to, um, to Los Angeles to film school. I'm just kind of curious what you're pursuing out there. Yeah, I actually um, I actually went to to San Francisco for school and then moved back to Buffalo and went to film school in Buffalo, New York. Uh, but I was, you know, it was, a, it was a program focused on writing. So writing, directing, producing is what I was most excited about. Moved out to LA, went out to LA for a summer internship with NBC and then moved out like literally three days after I graduated college, moved to LA. Wow. Wow. Super cool. Anything that you worked on that, that you care to tell about and talk about? Was there anything that stood out? My first job was really um, with a really incredible writer, William Monaghan. Um, he wrote The Departed, won an Oscar for oh, it, wrote other stuff. And when I worked with him, he was working on um, a film, London Boulevard. That was his first like writing and directing film. Yeah. So it was really fun to like be hands on in that process and see that transition for him too. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. All right. So so uh, we, we meet with this with this uh, holistic nutritionist and then, and she says, look, you got to cut out the processed foods. You Google and you make homemade almond milk. Yes, it and let's pick up from there. Let's start from there. Yeah. I fell in love with it, but it really quickly realized it was a pain in the butt to make. And it goes, it goes fast, especially when my, my boyfriend, who is now my husband would come home and like, just pick up the jar and chuck it down. I'm like, cool. That took three days for me to make because you have to soak the nuts and do all, you know, there's a whole process. Yeah. To, like, so I realized how amazing it was and also started to think about who actually needs this product. And it's probably because people that are living a busy, hectic life, um, mothers and, and families, most likely. And so it's like the thought process was, how do I get this product to them? And that was through local farmers markets. So in L.A., the farmers markets are thriving. They're super busy. Um, they're a destination a lot of people, including myself, do, you know, 80 to 90 percent of their grocery shopping at farmer's markets. And I got really lucky to get into a good one right away and started selling the product. And it, it took off from there and, and gave me the confidence to understand, hey, I'm really on to something. There is a need for this. And also the products that I make are really good. Yeah. 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 So you would make these like in your house, I would imagine. There's a lot of regulation around food, especially liquid. Um, you have to have a commercial kitchen. So I was lucky. Okay. Um, my journey to this, I didn't go directly from film to this. When I was in film, the film and TV world, I met a woman who was starting a snack bar company, like just bars. They were superfood bars. She was like new to it. She had just had a baby. We ended up talking. I was like, hey, let me help you like on the side for fun. Ended up going to work for her full time and helping her literally from taking this concept from her um, kitchen, her home kitchen, to selling in Whole Foods, which was oh quite a process. So I had yeah. learned a ton. 
And I had also seen that I had been exposed to other people in the food industry and like starting in a similar capacity, um, you know, starting um, with an idea, growing it to this to a small scale like grocery stores. And so I, I felt really confident that I could do that. Yeah. yeah, I knew how to do that. I had the drive. I already had the work ethic. I had done this for someone else. Um, and so I knew that if I I knew getting in the farmer's market was a really good way to to test it and understand. And I knew I could do volume there as well. Yeah. yeah. So you, you obviously uh, found a commercial kitchen or some resource to start making it a little bit more at scale. Exactly. And it it scaled pretty quickly. And this was one of those moments where I don't know why, but I was all in at the beginning. Like I did and uh-huh. I wasn't like, hey, let me it all the stars kind of aligned. So I left working with this woman. I got this um consulting job for a local like juice bar restaurant that just fell into my lap and like gave me a chunk, a small chunk of money. It was like five thousand dollars or something. So I could buy like my first bottles and my first small piece of equipment. Yeah. Um and I just like committed to doing it full time from there. Wow. I don't know why. I don't know if I would do that now. It seems kind of crazy. Uh, <laughs> That's every. I think every entrepreneur you look back. What was I thinking? Wow, that was risky. But yeah, you, ha- you know, you just you have to go all in. You have to burn your boats. Yeah. Yeah. So immediately, I had to figure out how to make it make money. I had one month in the red. That was my first month, and after yeah. that, it was you know we were in the green, and and I was getting paid. Certainly not a lot, um, but it was. I had built a business to that I had to survive off of. Yeah. So how do you then go from, if you can walk us on the journey from the farmer's market to obviously you had to scale somehow, maybe find a third party manufacturer or something to, to actually do this. So walk us on that journey because scaling is one of the hardest things, right? It's, you can have a great idea, you can do it in a pilot aspect, but it's the scale that just wears us out. And I'd love to hear that story. And it's so wearing you out as a, so, such a good <laughs> Much good language for it. Exhaustion, <laughs> just pure exhaustion. Yeah. And we um, were actually currently in the phase of finding our first potential like manufacturing partner. Mm-hmm. We still manufacture it ourselves. And mm-hmm. so we've grown through a few different facilities. Um, we run, manage our own facility, have our own production team, um, do all of our own R&D. And we actually just got to a place and to scale a, this product was a fresh product with a five day shelf life to start. So that's even crazier. Um, and we got to a point where we were selling it in some local shops. I got really lucky with a, a w- really well-known coffee shop found me at the farmer's market and said, Hey, we want you to make a barista blend for us to start selling in our coffee shops. And I didn't like it's not an idea I would have thought of on my own. This this again fell into my lap and started selling them almond milk for their coffee shops. Well, now instead of selling people, you know, a quart, 32 ounces of milk at a time, we're selling 50 gallons a week to a coffee shop. I was like, okay, there's something here. And we were sat, we, so we just started door knocking on all the coffee shops in LA and we could deliver fresh. So now we have like a, a little mini distribution company. We're delivering fresh product to them twice a week that has a five-day shelf life. It is a premium product, but it's so good and such a different experience with their coffee that it it worked. We got to a point, you know, and, and really we were doing like almost a million dollars in sales this way, but got to a point where I was like, okay, this is cool, but we need to, we want to figure out how to scale this. This And some of the coffee shops we were working with had locations in other cities. And I was can figure this out we'll take it in our other cities but we were not going to open a kitchen and i wasn't so crazy that i was going to open a kitchen in every you know every major city yeah so we started with our first iteration to scale which was a frozen concentrate and those are they're still on market great solved a first set of problems solved a first set of problems and allowed us to pivot quickly enough to like sustain the business while we figured out what is actually a long-term solution. And we didn't know it, but it was going to take us five years to fully roll out that long-term solution, which we just rolled out this year, which is um, first of its kind. We actually, you know, have patent pending process and technology around it. We created a dried powder version of our milks that is clean ingredients, steams and texturizes, has real nutritional value, tastes really great with coffee. And we launched those on the market this year. Um, oh, so wow, it's been, 
huge journey and a huge transition and a path that I, you know, standing at the farmer's market that first day, I, if you would have walked up to me and told me this is what the story was going to be, I would have been like, no, that's insane. <laughs> so, so you're, you're, and you're already, you know, can be a writer and a, and a, and a, a director. So you, when this is all done, you're going to have a beautiful story to actually be your first feature. I love that. Hey, everyone. As you know, I don't have any advertisements nor sponsorships on this podcast. My only ask of you, the listener, is that you share this podcast with someone that you know, a friend, a family member, a coworker, or a colleague who may benefit from this information, may benefit from today's guest, from the value that they're, they're sharing with the audience, with you, the listener. When you share this podcast and our audience grows, it allows me to book more and more guests who have a great message, great nuggets of wisdom that you can benefit from. And again, your network can benefit from. So please right now, push that share button, send it to somebody that you care about. And let's get back to the interview. You know, my bad, we kind of skipped over why this product is so different. And that's what caught me when I was doing the research for this podcast of and really kind of awakened me to what I have been drinking. Can you speak to how your product is markedly different and really what's on the market in the grocery stores right now and how different that is from what you're actually offering, if you could explain that. Yeah, absolutely. So because of my journey, and and now you guys know that journey, we everything that we do, every just we make goes through the lens of, is this going to be healthy and, and good for people? So that's not something that all foods, <laughs> that's not a lens that all food companies um, work through. And so for us, that means one, using the highest quality ingredients, using more of them. So there's actual nutrition value, as I shared, you know, um, container of almond milk has, if you look at the nutrition box, there's, you know, one gram of protein per serving. Ours has six grams of protein per serving. So if you're using real, real food, there's real protein, there's, you know, fiber, there's fat, there's all kinds of things that ours has that other plant-based milks don't have. We do almond, oat, and hemp, all separate SKUs. Um, the oat milks on the market, beyond there being a bunch of binders and gums and fillers in these products, um, and they do that because it's cheaper than using real food. But beyond that, you know, the oat milks on the market, which everyone has kind of hit this oat milk craze, um, most of them have seed oils in them, which are incredibly inflammatory and harmful for our health. There's weird processing. This is a whole other layer of the food industry that people just have no clue about. And there's not information on the packaging. Like you have to dig and really understand how food is made to, to learn this. But the processing is really dangerous. So oat milks, they use an enzyme that breaks the oats down into a sludge, essentially, which is actually maltose, converts it to sure. maltose. Yeah. So any of your listeners can Google um Oatly, which is a brand, Oatly, the new Coca-Cola, and an amazing article will come up breaking down how oat milks are made and also sharing the fact that you would be better off from a sugar perspective drinking a Coca-Cola than having oat milk. Wow. Wow. And these are products that people think are healthy for them. So it's incredible. It's incredibly frustrating. They're products people are drinking first thing in the morning. Um, you know, Starbucks has a brown sugar oat milk latte. Like you're literally <laughs> giving someone diabetes. Yeah, I was gonna say that's diabetes type two, just waiting to happen. Just waiting yeah. to happen. Yeah. Yes. And wow. so that's where a lot of our drive and frustration comes in is yes, we want to make a better product, but these products that are on the market are not only not you know, not good for you. They're actually can be really damaging to people's health, especially if you're already in a vulnerable um, position with your health. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a huge part of, of this that has to be education. And I, I guess I would, I just, we have a, a couple of franchises. One of them is an infrared sauna franchise, infrared sauna studio in LA. Everybody knows what that is in, you know, Des Moines, Iowa, not really. And yeah. I'm curious. I would just love to hear your thought. You know, you are having to educate a consumer before you can sell a consumer, which well, is not the easiest thing because the market is not well versed in it. How, what approach have you taken to educate? Because you're going up against big food, you know, that not easy, not easy. Like yeah. I, maybe big tobacco is the only other, you know, or big pharma, you know, uh, which I worked for for 25 years. You know, those, those are hard, hard companies to, to go up against. So what is what has been your strategy from an education standpoint? Yeah. 
we, you know, we we're lucky that we were in a time of social media that's super mm. helpful. And we tend to be very blunt and clear on social media, you yeah. know, so obviously we talk a lot, a lot about why, why are our products and what's better and the good things, but we, we don't shy away from also sharing like, Hey, this is what's in the other stuff. And I think just like the experience you had, once you know, it's incredibly eye opening and you can't go back, especially if you are head of your household responsible for buying the groceries and feeding your entire family. Um, and we also have had this really lucky channel through these coffee shops where people just get to taste the product. Yeah. It, you know, and that is you don't need any education there to taste it and be like, whoa, this is really good. This is different. Yeah. So I think part of our wins is we try and hit on everything that people care about. Taste, quality, experience. Um, now we have this huge sustainability piece of reducing packaging because we're doing powders. Um, and so we kind of win at every level and and hope that the people who are looking for those things find us and then hope that we can, you know, touch some some people with one of the pieces of information that will click and make sense to them. Yeah. But getting to taste it and experience it is like it has been by far like the, the biggest it. people yeah, having it. it. So we go in these higher end coffee shops. You walk into the coffee shop, you know, you're getting a quality beverage. You understand the values of their coffee and then to have our milk paired with it, you automatically understand the values of our milk as well. Yeah. And, and so if I understand you correctly, you've, you've gone from this five day shelf life, which is a brutal supply chain to even think about to, um, is it, is it like a freeze dried process type of thing or some, I guess for layman's terms, something like that? For layman's terms. Yeah. It's a drying yeah. process. Um, yeah. it's a lot gentler and more efficient than more energy efficient than freeze drying. But yeah, we've gone from five days to six year a six year shelf life oh my gosh and then so so people will get these packages and then you um you mix it with i guess water is this right to, to reconstitute it then okay yeah so one of the big unlocks is that it's water soluble so you don't have to blend it or you know mm. uh, use an immersion blender or anything you can just put it in water give it a shake and it dissolves into essentially homemade milk wow so so where are you so now if, if i understand this correct you've really unlocked the key to be able to ship this nationwide i mean really worldwide but but nationwide for sure and so what does your distribution look like you know the listeners for this are all over the globe but 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 um, yeah. but mostly in the united states so where where are you available in the united states currently yeah so the best place is on on our website still okay. we've rolled um the powders are on the website they're frozen it's too and we can ship ship nationally um but we've really been thoughtful about our rollout process so we've rolled out with a bunch of um cafe partners in southern california and the next three years will be global we i mentioned earlier we're in this interesting stage now of saying okay we need a manufacturing partner for this we need someone you know we've been kind of accidental manufacturers up until this point and it served us but now we have a product that is ready to go we have the opportunity to sell massive amounts of it we need a partner who's a professional at this and so we're in that stage of, of finalizing a partner oh, for I them. Love it. and i can only imagine we talked about the education standpoint gosh this product seems just perfect for some type of celebrity influencer endorsement um for, for those of you listening on spotify or apple she just smiled ear to ear so i'd imagine that you're probably working on something uh, along those lines um <laughs> So there's a little a bit of a fine, poker tell there. Yeah. 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 It's a fine line because we always want to remain authentic too. So it has to have to be the right person. But sure. yes, this product hits every everything that someone would, would want to represent. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Good. That's great. That's I would love to hear you talk about. So you you've said so many times, uh, one, you've you've said lucky like five times, six times. I'll tell you right now. Maybe one time you get lucky, but I have found that people like you, you're putting yourself in a position to be lucky, right? Maybe the fact there's a nutritionist on the hiking trail in front of you, okay, that's luck. But then everything you've done since then, that's hard work meeting preparation, quite frankly. So give yourself credit for that. What have what have been, so, so you said, I you just admitted, admitted and said, hey, look, I'm an accidental entrepreneur, which I, I think most of us kind of are how have you learned the lessons without the scars? How have you, or what, what steps have you taken? What resources, what mentors, what, you know, what, how have you tried to shorten your distance between novice and, okay, I'm, I'm an experienced entrepreneur that just so the listeners could benefit from that as well. Yeah. Well, one, I'd say I have plenty of scars. <laughs> and my, it, may not be, it may not be visible, but I don't think you you know, I think that 
regardless of the success of your business and your entrepreneurial journey, there is there are other successes that come with being an entrepreneur. And I yeah. think that journey allows you to grow so much as a human. Um, and, you know, no matter what comes of this company or any company I created in the future, the growth that I ha- have had, and sometimes it's day to day, sometimes I am a different person <laughs> today than I was yesterday because of all the things I, I learned and went through yesterday. And so I think that no matter what, there's like, the journey is really rewarding because you just get to understand yourself and life in, in a very different way. Um, so plenty of scars, plenty of learnings along the way. Um, the biggest thing that I've done and, and the journey can be confusing, especially when you're a first time entrepreneur and, and early on, you know, we fundraise and I, what I did in my first fundraise and when I first brought on investors was like, ah, a sigh of relief. Like I finally have people who know what they're doing involved. Right. And I gave away some of my power. And I, I did that in, in more than more than once in this journey. And you quickly realize no one knows more about your business than you. No one's more interested or more invested in moving it along than you. And so I've had some mentors along the way, um, definitely gotten good advice. The most impactful thing has been building a founder network. And those founders that are even at the same level as you. Um, but a founder's perspective is just very different than anyone else. Someone who's been in there and built something from the ground up. Um, so having a founder network has been the number one biggest, biggest asset for every piece from fundraising to the low moments where you're just like, man, I just have to talk to someone about this yeah. and <laughs> get it out or someone to confirm I'm not crazy or... Yep. Um, so our, that would be spouses true. can only listen so much to like, I'm yeah. losing my mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. And they totally yeah. relate so much too. And for me, yeah. it gets more complicated because my husband's involved in the company now. He yeah. runs operations. Um, so that's very complex. And I've been grateful because he understands a lot of it even more, but still a very different position running operations than being the one out dealing with investor relations and sales and um, but I think like the biggest thing that served me in this journey is just showing up, like committing to showing up every day. And, and there's some days where I'm not maybe not showing up in the best, the best that I want to be. But like the mindset of like getting out of bed, showing up. Yeah, I love that you just said that because that is 80 percent of it. Uh, my my experience has been it's 80 percent of it because the natural attrition of just human beings saying, you know what, I can't do this anymore. And you keep showing up pretty soon, the competition starts to thin out. And it's not quite as as challenging. I mean, I, I will probably, you know, I will go to my deathbed saying that entrepreneurship is one of the hardest things you can do. And I don't know if it really ever gets easier. I think just the challenges that once you solve something in the business, something else breaks and then you got to solve that. And then something else, you know, the problems just get bigger and, and the money gets bigger and the risk gets bigger. Um, but I love that you just said that showing up, especially on the days. And I'm sure you felt this where you're like, I don't want to do this today. This is just really, really, really hard. And it's been hard for as long as I can remember. But those are the days you have to get up and show up. And then the next day, sometimes it's a little easier, you know, and the next day is a little easier. Then it gets hard again, but you're right. I, I'm glad that you said that because people need to hear that. And, and so that, the you know, people's eyes are wide open going into this because, and I love that you said that you grow as a person. I hadn't really heard that just said the way you, you said it, but it's true. Entrepreneurship. Yeah. You, you make money and you can create jobs and stuff, but the personal growth that you experience, you're right. It's, it's like a rocket ship to personal growth because the business forces you, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it forces you, you know, the trauma that it pulls up but in other if you you know we're yep. in another position in life you may might be able to bury forever and like sometimes that sounds kind of nice like i don't want to face my trauma <laughs> today. um but you can't do that when you are leading a, a company and it just throws it in your face and you have to you know the only way out is through um yep. with a lot with a lot of things and yep. through is so intense sometimes but every time you get on the other side and you're like whoa 
I did it and I am so much better of a person for doing it. And my perspectives on life and the world are completely different. And I'm yeah. grateful. I, um, gentleman that works with me here, we've, we've talked and joked so much about this that, and I've read so many biographies of founders, um, uh, and I like, like you, like it just, it's so great to read or hear or something, or hear a podcast where like, okay, I'm not crazy. Everyone else is, it's that hard for everyone else too. And you know, in every founder story, you know, it's like the wheels are coming off at every second and then, but somehow they keep the, the car on the, on the road. But we were, we were kind of joking that almost all these biographies, they talk about, you know, even Steve Jobs, every, you know, Elon Musk, there's a certain level, I believe there's a certain level of trauma that is almost in your earlier life, in your childhood, whenever, that is almost healthy because it drives you, right? It, it drives you to achieve something, to prove something, to do no trauma, no, not very motivated, too much trauma. Obviously, you know, you're in therapy for the, your whole life and, and, and you know, you're dealing with that. But, but there's like, a, I swear that, and, and maybe I'm wacko for saying it, but there's like this sweet spot of childhood hardness, whatever that form that took, that I think serves us well as entrepreneurs when we're, when we're in our, our business. Uh, yeah. It's something I'm, I'm working through this exact topic. It's something I'm trying to like wrap my head around right now because absolutely, you're hundred percent right. It does. It serves us. But is there a point where it stops serving us? Mm is what I'm trying to figure out. And it's like the hustle that for me personally, it's been this realization of like, oh, this it's this prove it energy. Like, let me prove it. Let me prove my value. You know, I had scenario in as a kid, I was abandoned by my father. Well, let me prove to you what a mistake that was. Yeah. You know, yeah. investors that say, no, no, cool. Just another chip on my shoulder. Let me prove to you that you are going to regret saying, saying no. Yeah. And so that energy does serve you. And I've done, you know, there's um, a bunch of different tests you can take. And and one of an, an actual one of our investors, it was really cool. They before they even have a conversation with you, they have this specific like personality test that they have you take. And, you know, depending on how you score, they'll then take a call with you. And, and um, I scored my drive to win is higher than 98 <laughs> percent. You take, yeah. have take their test. And that's like really cool, but it's also like, man, what damage, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, what has gotten me to that point? And then you hit a place in life too, where it's like, cool, the hustle there, there's, there's a time and a, a space for all of that to serve me. And, you know, now I, I have a kid and that completely changes your perspective on mm -hmm. like, and I'm now in a stage of like, that stuff has served me. What will serve me best for this next chapter of my business? It and it probably isn't still that like prove it, you know, egoic energy. And how do I let that go? And also find like allow me to find peace in running a bit because the stress and chaos and excitement and adrenaline are incredible, but they can't they they can't be the main feeling. It's forever. not sustainable. It's not sustainable. Yeah, yeah. I'm really, I, I'm just grateful that you shared that um, because I, I think that so many people will benefit from evaluating and that self-discovery of what is this drive? Why am I doing this? What am I, you know, and again, you can choose to let it continue to drive you. You can choose to, I'm going to, I'm going to move past that and find other things. But I think that self, that self-reflection is just critical as growing as a human being. But it just happens to be through the conduit of business that we, that we are forced to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about Rome? I would just love to hear a little bit about Rome and, and, and what that is. Yeah. Yeah. Rome potentially came in this chapter of, of answering that exact question. Like, you know, how, what would a business look like that was a little bit less of a prove-it energy that maybe was a little more collaborative, that was less pressure and just for fun? And so this idea came, a girlfriend of mine who who actually started as as one of my first employees, she was my assistant years ago, grew into head of sales for our company and has become one of my closest friends. She went to Morocco on a trip and came back and brought me this beautiful rug and, you know, was talking about how how amazing it was and how she'd love and how she's brought pieces back for everyone. And they're so in love with them and how she'd love to do that, you know, as a as a job. And 
literally that night she left and I couldn't stop thinking about it. One, the piece was so beautiful. My do- my two-year-old's obsessed with it. Like, it just was bringing so much joy into our household and um, just got this download of the business name, the how it would work, um, like created this entire business in my head in like three hours. I couldn't stop thinking about it. And so I went back to her and we have a girlfriend who's an interior designer and went to her and said, hey, this is a business for the three of us. And this is about friendship, collaboration, storytelling, bringing pieces to people that inspire them, inspire them to think about other worlds, other lands, inspire them to think about their next adventure, just like bright in their room. And so it's a it's a new business. And um, we designed it around, you know, importing and traveling and bringing in textiles and 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 sharing them with people. Um, but it's it's really shifting to so much more than that. We really like the inspiration, the community vibe around it. Like it's been really cool. So we're trying to figure out it feels like a much bigger space um, and a much bigger container um, for more than just sharing textiles, uh, which I think when you have when you're open to collaboration, um, I think it just can open so many doors. And so for me, I'm going this job where I'm a solo founder, which has been it feels like it has been necessary for this journey. We've had to move quickly and, you know, make decisions. And obviously I've been on my own um, personal journey with running this business. Um, it's really exciting to have partners yeah. for the first time and collaboration and something that has a little less pressure and a little more creativity to it. Yeah. Super cool. And it's really, it's, you know, as you said uh, earlier, you know, uh, wanted to be a filmmaker, like this is your creativity. I can, I can feel that this is your yeah. create allowing, you know, you to be more creative and that's great. That's great. Um, all right. So a couple of last questions for you here. Um, my listeners know I'm an avid reader. I love we talked about, you know, uh, founder stories and you know, all, all these biographies, biographies. Has there been a book, it doesn't have to be a biography, but has there been a book, a business book, a bio, something that you've read that you put that book down and you said, wow, I will never think about this subject the same way. This, this hit me right between the eyes. And is, is there, is there one that you could recommend to the listeners? Yeah. Um, I mean, I've had moments so my first moment with like that was with a film uh, was the film The Departed. And I saw it in theater. I was in film school and I saw it in theater and I was like, this is why I'm going into films. It's the storytelling aspect. And then I ended up working for the writer of it, which was crazy. Um, there's a book, man, it is it is not coming to mind right now. Let me see if I have it. Actually, I do have it on my desk. Originals Here. by Adam Grant. Yeah. A nonconformist move the world. Okay. Yeah. Really inspiring. Um, especially one, I think I, I think it's good for me. It's been good to read while I'm in my business to like reignite the like passion and drive and and do it, try and do it from a different place of the not prove me, prove it energy. But anyone who's thinking about starting a business or has this great idea where they're like maybe or uh, why me like yes this is a good idea but am i the right one or why would i be able to to push through it's a really good book for that okay we'll actually put that in the show notes too so people can they can reference it um okay last couple of questions and this is not to be morbid at all um it's just it's a good question to ponder so we fast forward to the end of your very full very rich fulfilling life but we're, we're at your funeral you're looking down from above and and, and a loved one is reading your eulogy but they can only use three words to describe you. What would you hope that the life you've lived would lead them to say in three words or less? Wow. <laughs> Having a kid makes you think about that moment a lot. It I does. don't know if you've experienced that, yeah. but for the first time ever, thinking about the end of your life and no regrets, I think she was kind mm. it's beautiful beautiful that's something to aspire to i love it i love it to me that question is for all, all of us should be able to think about that question often and then that's how we set our intentions for the day like am i fulfilling that you know absolutely yeah. i i i agree with that and i had a moment recently where something triggered me to think about it in a similar way what's your biggest fear and you know, historically, I would have said failure, and I've I've 
I'm I'm past that phase in life, which feels really good. But I realized like my biggest fear is not not living life to the, the fullest, not like being whatever the most expanded version of myself is. And so that is kind of what dictates, you know, my my motivation for each yeah. day. How how am I taking, you know, and it feels like a little bit of a big thing, but if you do take it day by day, like, cool, what am I gonna do today to be the version of myself? People are so focused on living the length of their life and, you know, living that and they lose sight of living the width of their life. It's living yeah. the width of your life is just as important as living the length of your life, if not more important, if not more important. Um, all right. Uh, second to last question. If you had a magic wand and you wake up tomorrow and, and you can weigh this magic wand and make one material change to the world, like the world is different according to Brooke. How would the world be different after you wave that magic wand? Yeah, I, that is such an incredible and intense question <laughs> considering all that is going on. Going on right now, sure. Well, yeah, I wish, you know, I, I think there's so much divide in so many different areas around like good or bad differences, right or wrong. I wish that if I could wave a wand, I think that people could just have the willingness to accept other perspectives and not have to label them as right or wrong or good or bad and just accept, okay, that's your perspective. That is fine for you. I'm still going to hold on to my perspective and not have this like battle and not have, you know, not have everything so black and, and white. And I think that that could solve a lot of problems if we just had a little more passion and understanding and willingness to like listen and let go. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, I, I absolutely agree with you a hundred percent. I had a gentleman um, answer that question with, he goes, you know, if it's been 6,000 years and I've been throwing rocks at you and you've been throwing rocks at me, maybe it's time we sit down and have a cup of coffee and figure out what's going on here. You know, <laughs> and, it's, and he actually said that a couple months ago before all hell broke loose in the, in the Mideast, but it is just communication. Yeah. There are some simple answers and not that, you know, lucky we don't have to be the one ones figuring out those answers, you know, um, but it really, I think a lot of situations really can be less complicated than we, we make them. And yes, communication. I use that, remind myself of that constantly in my life, like clear and heartfelt communication. And, you know, that takes work <laughs> for, yeah, sure, for you know? sure. It's intentional. Um, yeah. I certainly have not perfected it by any means, but if we can communicate clearly and from the heart, so, so much could be solved and so much more could get done. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Um, so for the audience listening, good milk, um, is spelt G O O D M Y L K. So just so people find you, but, but if you could share with us how people can one find your products and as importantly, find you, follow you and just be part of your story going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking. So goodmilk.co, Good Milk Co. is the name of the company. That's our website, but um, lots of fun information, informational information, fun stuff happening on Instagram at Good Milk Co. Okay. And then you can follow me, um, Brooke, B-R-O-O-K-E underscore Harris Official on Instagram. Okay. Harris Official. And we'll put that in the show notes too, so people can just click on it and go right there. Well, yeah. um, Brooke, Wonderful conversation. I've thoroughly enjoyed this, and you are a dyed in the wool entrepreneur. Like you're, you're, you're doing it. You're doing it, and it's <laughs> exciting to hear about. I love it. I love it, and just your, your, your spirit is wonderful. So thank you for taking the time today to, to share with me. Thank you, Roger. This has been lovely. Thank you for tuning in to the Thrive More podcast. Don't forget to take a look at the show notes for any of the resources that we mentioned during the podcast. And if you haven't already. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on your notifications so you have access to the latest and the greatest. You can connect with me on any of the socials at Real Roger Martin. And be sure to check out our website, thrivemorebrands.com. There you'll find information on the brands we support and information on franchising. Thanks again for tuning in.